Let's do it. Well, hello, hello everybody. Happy February 21st to everybody. Um, once again, my name is Adil Alam. I'll be one of your moderators for the webinar uh, today. Um, and we'd like to thank everybody who's joined us today. Uh, uh, we always appreciate your interest in our CMBS webinar series. Our typical announcements prior to starting, um, please do check out our YouTube channel. <clears throat> Excuse me, check out our YouTube channel for all of our previous webinars we've had in the past couple of months. Um, also, we are in the midst of completing our clinical engineering standards of practice, which is being updated from our 2014 version to our 2023. Um, and we'll also be relaunching um, our peer review uh, for those standards of practice. So if you are interested, um, please contact the CMBS Secretariat. Uh, this is a great way of ensuring that you know your biomed department is once again ready for accreditation, number one, and number two is optimal, is optimal and operating at its most optimal uh, optimal way. Um, today, we are continuing our webinar series. And once again, this was in lieu of the uh, annual conference that we did not have in 2023. And speaking of annual conferences, uh, our one in Vancouver, which is from May 16th to the 18th, will be starting and registration is open for that as well. So please, please make sure you can check out the website um, for, for any uh, specifics on the conference. There's a dedicated page for that. So we hope to see you in Van beautiful Vancouver in May. For this, for this webinar specifically, um, once again, we'll be utilizing our chat functionality and our Q&A functionality. So preference if you can answer, or excuse me, ask your questions during Q&A, you can ask them throughout the presentation, but the presenters will be answering those questions at the end of the presentation. So for today's webinar, this is sort of a continuation of our right to repair uh, series, if you wanna call it that. We had our introduction from the American perspective, uh, I believe it was in, in October. Um, now we're gonna be touching a bit on the European and the Canadian perspective with our uh, expert presenters. Um, so we, uh, and we'll focus on the right to repair in Italy and Europe. Um, and we are, uh, sorry, we're happy to have Alberto Lazzani with us. And following that presentation, we'll get uh, the presentation of the right to repair approach from the Northwest Territories and how they're testing out specific policies and procedures which mandate the right to repair uh, in Northwest Territories and all health technology purchases, amongst other things. Um, so with that, I'll ask Michael if you can give us a quick over present the presenters. Happy to. Yes, we actually were very happy as uh, the CMBS um, committee to uh, kind of um, give the benediction for Kevin to go on our behalf to present along with Roberto to the uh, to the European Congress, the Italian Congress, for uh, on this subject. So we're really happy that, that Roberto can come uh, and with Kevin present for us uh, to get different perspectives. Um, really looking forward to this talk. As, as uh, Adil was mentioning, this is uh, a very important uh, stone and a string of stones on this uh, on this critical topic to all of us. So uh, without further ado, I'll say benvenuti to uh, Alberto. He's coming from Cremona, the land of violins. And yeah. um, he, uh, he has a slightly different perspective because he's been a clinical engineer since about 2002. Great uh, experience yeah. in the hospitals, uh, but now he's actually with uh, with the firm. So he actually gave us not just a European uh, perspectives, but a slightly different in the stream of support for medical devices uh, viewpoint for us. Mm -hmm. So the way we're going to do it today is uh, Roberto is going to present first about 20 minutes. Um, and then uh, Kevin will present and we'll do Q&A um, at the end as normal. Uh, and any answers that we can't um, answer today during the session, or if you have some specific questions for, for Alberto, we'll do a normal, we'll take those, um, those written questions and uh, we'll get answers for you and then send them out to the, to the membership. Uh, so without uh, further ado, um, Alberto, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you to CMBS for this inv invitation. I hope to contribute to your education on right to repair. I have put in the first slide um, a little advertisement on, a, on our uh, 30 Congress. Um, maybe we uh, will give the possibility to 
uh, also uh, establish a connection with a, uh, an international webinar, uh, and I will update our um, website. This uh, this one I, I, I am pointing uh, for this uh, event um, possible connection. Um, let me have first a glance on right to repair in Europe. Right to repair is three words that in Europe uh, legislative are very present. Uh, in 2021, uh, um, uh, the European Commission put forward a, a proposal on right to repair with the aim to encourage consumers to use products for longer by repairing, uh, obviously, defective goods and purchasing more second and refurbished goods. Um, first, uh, uh, it was expected, like a reference point, uh, to be adopted, this uh, legislative proposal, on March 2023. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the situation with uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia war um, attract attention on other topics, more important. Uh, but, uh, you can find right to repair in many important document, European documents. For example, the European Green Deal, the New Circular Economy Action Plan, or, or the New Consumer Agenda, where you can find precisely the words right to repair. Uh, because Europe is going to uh, protect environment also with a right to repair strategy. Uh, if you, if we, we, we find something more vertical, more, more, more uh, specific, we can uh, also find some decision in, in Europe. Uh, the, the, the one I show you is for electronic displays, where uh, the European uh, community want uh, that the manufacturers of these electronic displays uh, uh, answer to precise criterion of building. Uh, one of them is the reparability and commercial guarantee criterion, where uh, the community want a design for repair of these devices and want the manufacturers give uh, the possibility to everyone to assess to repair manual and all the information on service uh, for servicing uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, devices. Um, in Europe, you can also have on your product, in particular on electronic product, a, a sort of mark, a label. Uh, this is the eco label mark. Uh, that is a, a sort of award that uh, receives some products that answer to precise um, uh, green requirements. Inside these requirements, you also find repair related uh, requirement. Um, Europe wants to uh, having commerce uh, devices easy to repair and recyclable. In Europe, you can find also some association. This one is BEUC. Um, that is an association that um, uh, unit under uh, this name, um, 46 independent consumer organizations from all the countries of the uh, European community with the role to defend the interest of, of European consumers. Um, the uh, most concern of this uh, association is uh, what they call uh, premature obsolescence, programmed obsolescence. Uh, manufacturers are um, the, uh, accused to produce uh, devices with a programmed obsolescence that is against the right to repair policy. And what, what politicians do? Um, they are, are more sensitive on the right to repair uh, topic, uh, especially in particular about uh, the uh, impact of the right to repair on environment. So um, you can find many times right to repair in EU uh, regulations, uh, but only uh, address it only in relation with uh, the uh, and protection of the environment. Then you can find also a company like MV Autonomy that uh, promote uh, also other uh, activities like renovate technical equipment for rehabilitation center, hospital and care centers. Indeed, uh, there is 
that, that there are no rules to protect medical devices uh, right to repair specifically uh, if we talk about medical devices uh, we uh, refer to uh, the uh, medical devices directive um, that was born in 1993 and now is on the verge of expiring amended by another regulation that i will show you next slides but uh, just the first uh, medical device directive uh, said very clearly that all the manufacturers need to uh, release and to uh, make available details of the nature and frequency of the maintenance and calibration needed to ensure the safety and the functionality of the devices. Uh, the, the real problem is that no one wants to, to, to respect it because there is a law, but no one wants to respect it. The new uh, regulation, MDL 745, uh, that is going to amend the last directive is uh, even more strictly because, uh, as you can read, uh, manufacturers are obliged to give details of the nature and frequency of preventives and regular maintenance. So every, every time I buy a device, I should receive uh, with the device also the checklist of preventive maintenance, for example, and all the uh, service manual and all the calibration uh, to ensure that the device operates properly and safely. And also all the methods for eliminating the risk encountered not by the users, but by person involved in installing, calibrating and servicing the device. So maybe if we uh, insist on this uh, point of the uh, regulations, um, we should also have what we need um, also without a, a right to repair law. Then what about Italy? I need to uh, first show you how uh, Italian market on medical device maintenance run. Um, we divide for, for finding uh, which is the partner that usually assists medical devices. We need to divide it in three uh, groups, the uh, medical devices in Italy. We have the high technology where you can find linear, linear accelerator, city pet, city system, NMR, angiographic system, and the big system, the big and expensive system. Uh, I, I've called it uh, I've called this group high technology. Uh, then you have uh, all, the, all, all the devices that are in loan for use in rental, like laboratory automation system, laboratory analyzer, dialysis machines, and so on. And then you have all the other technologies that I, I've called to uh, and group them together, white technology units that are the, 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 the ones you know and you find every day in your hospital, US units, electrosurgical units, operation room lamps, microscope, endoscope, and so on. Now, we have divided in three, three parts the market of uh, uh, maintenance in Italy. Uh, then you can find the more than 80% of high technology managed by OEM. Uh, in my company, I manage uh, high technology system. Sometimes I manage it uh, uh, with my personal, sometimes I uh, encounter it on uh, OEMs. Um, then RU maintenance is not interesting in this, in this uh, presentation because we are talking about something that is not of property of a hospital. So it's obvious that the manufacturers um, uh, follow directly and uh, this machine and, and uh, they do uh, directly maintenance on them. Uh, then we have WTU maintenance, so all the other uh, devices inside the hospital that in Italy is mainly in the hands of company like mine, ISO company and multivendor. With a little strange thing that you can find in this group of company also the OEM like G, Philips, Siemens, they are producer and they are also multi-vendor and ISO company. This is strange. Uh, what about the money? The HD maintenance market is worth approximately around 500, 600 euro per year. Uh, all the maintenance of the other devices 
is worth approximately uh, four five hundred euros per year. So this is the uh, money that go around uh, this market. From another point of view, if we want to make a statistics, uh, every 100 hospital, we can find the, the, this kind of trend. Less than five manage maintenance of medical device on their own. So they have internal personnel and uh, they also have some uh, contracts with OEMs. More than 85 hospital manage maintenance uh, with an ISO company contract. Uh, then the ISO company could, uh, if uh, it wants, uh, establish also OEM contract uh, on uh, uh, lower technology or also on high technology. Then you have less than 10 hospitals that manage maintenance, uh, making dozens of uh, contracts with all the manufacturers they have. You can't find also rule for right to repair in Italy. Uh, right to repair in Italy is not three words that you can find on laws and rules. I hope that we follow uh, quickly the European legislation. Uh, obviously, the uh, daily situation, see uh, our company, uh, the ISO and multivendor company in fight with the OEMs. I don't think to say something new for you. Uh, and uh, the uh, OEMs claims uh, the, the uh, right to manage their own system for the same old reason. I put them inside these slides. I don't want to, to talk about them because they're, they're very uh, famous. Um, in my experience, like uh, operation director in Polygon, um, we have about 600 of employee inside our hospitals. Uh, around uh, 100 hospitals managed um, from the northern part to Sicily. Uh, about uh, 500,000 of medical devices managed directly with uh, all the responsibility on, on them. And we have uh, calculated about 1 million of maintenance services per year uh, where you can find preventive, corrective uh, maintenance and safety tests and so on. Um, in this presentation, I would like to stress uh, two uh, examples of uh, why we need uh, to uh, uh, promote right to repair. Uh, today is the 21st of February. I, I realized just some minutes ago, on 21st of February of 2020, Italy was put in lockdown uh, uh, for COVID uh, uh, infections. So this is a, a sad anniversary. Uh, and I remember very well because I live in the, in the worst uh, area where COVID uh, um, uh, put the people uh, in, in bad condition, in bad situation, and many people died about COVID, for COVID. I remember very well that uh, we need pulmonary ventilator like breath. Every day, uh, some uh, clinician call us for another pulmonary ventilator. So you need, you know, uh, the pulmonary ventilator were, was very precious at the time. And people was very stressed inside the world of uh, uh, intensive unit care, nurses and uh, clinicians. Um, and uh, happened that uh, a famous model of a famous brand of pulmonary ventilator was blocked with the possibility to reset the message of error. I add spare parts, original and new spare parts. I had all the know-how for making preventive maintenance, but I did not have the password to reset the alarm. So uh, we did obviously preventive maintenance on schedule, but uh, uh, every day the clinicians that uh, put on uh, the, the, the device, see that message and was very worried and was very anxious and stressed about this condition. Okay, in, in that situation, when you think to find collaboration from everybody, uh, the uh, manufacturer said to us that uh, they want 500 euros each ventilator for resetting alarm. We need to call them, obviously, I spent 
some thousand, uh, uh, some dozen of thousand of euros for having only the arm reset, and they put down on their uh, uh, intervention uh, document that the uh, maintenance was okay, and they already reset the alarm. This is not uh, more acceptable in my opinion. Then another, another example that I want to, um, to talk about, that just in this January, this January in 2023, a very big company that you know sure, very well, um, that produces and also make his, makes maintenance on, on their um, uh, brand of medical devices, wrote to all the third party companies uh, that uh, they won't give any more uh, on demand services. So it has just happened that some um, anesthesia machine or electrocardiograph or some. Uh, 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 unit portable Rx portable unit uh, was blocked by a failure, and uh, they leave the uh, device unrepaired because uh, uh, an ISO company um, is uh, interested in repairing, and they don't want to give uh, a collaboration to an ISO company. Uh, I think this is an unfair commercial practice, or even an abuse of dominant position, uh, but until we don't have someone who can, who, who, who can uh, uh, make this uh, um, uh, contrary opinion possible on that manufacturers, we, we will not win. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, jump also some concept to stay inside my 20 minutes of presentation. Uh, what I suggest first, uh, when we buy a device, we are going to sign a contract. Every time we buy a device, we are signing a contract. Also, if we don't know it. So if I want to sign a contract with all the requirements, I need to put the requirements also for the uh, period after the warranty expirations for all the time uh, of the lifetime of the device. So uh, uh, I need to uh, choose uh, devices um, also uh, in, in order to uh, have spare parts after uh, during the, in their lifetime uh, have a service manual and have the possibility to repair them. So I have written if all of us were aware of, of, about the, import the importance of the purchase provisions, the battle would, would uh, have to be won. But, uh, for example, in our hospitals, we are divided into uh, clinical engineers that make maintenance and clinical engineers that buy uh, devices. And the clinical engineers that buy devices are not so sensitive to this problem. They buy, they're going to buy uh, the best condition, uh, economical, especially condition, and they don't worry what they need to do about the, the rest of the life of the, of, of the device. So this is one of the Italian problem. Then um, we also need to underline how you can buy uh, uh, service uh, maintenance uh, or how you can buy a device in Italy. Uh, you can buy it uh, by participating to a tender where uh, usually 30 points is given to economical price. So the less you do, the, the more points you, you, you obtain and 70 points for technical projects. So I suggest we need to give points also to the possibility to repair the devices. And I want to show you what France uh, just put uh, as a reality, the famous French repairability index not unfortunately on medical devices, but on electronics products like washing machines, smartphones, and laptops. Um, they give like a, 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 a institution, a governmental institution, a, a determined score based on how these products are uh, green and respond to a repair a related requirement. So for example, uh, the repair index is about uh, the variability of uh, technical documentation, easy of disassembly, 
uh, availability of spare parts and so on. And I think that also for purchasing medical devices or for purchasing um, uh, assistance, so maintenance, a contract of maintenance on medical devices, we need to put uh, a, a sort of index where people that get the market free give, uh, receive a night uh, score uh, or the manufacturers at the moment would receive a, a, a very low score. Uh, I don't want to, uh, to go uh, beyond my, my minutage. So I thank you uh, very much for my invitation. I, I hope to um, collaborate in an international uh, network for the right to repair and uh, uh, for um, fight the battle every day with uh, OEMs to obtain a, a free market. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much, Alberto. Very, very interesting. Um, I like how you finished with the French Repairability Index. I think that uh, if we can internationally um, kind of jump start from, from that, I think that's one of our best ways to, to move forward um, as uh, international um, group of clinical engineers. Um, so again, thank you very, very much. And um, thank you. I will now pass the floor to, to Kevin Taylor, who's uh, Regional Director for Clinical Engineering in, uh, in the North for Northwest Territories, as well as Nunavut. Um, he has a slide, uh, which again, will remind us just how large the area is that his team covers. Uh, it's really quite impressive. I was doing a little check and um, I'm pretty sure it's even bigger than the largest African country of Algeria. So very, very challenging uh, uh, space to, to cover. So uh, um, just to, just a little reminder. Um, so Alberto, unfortunately, has a previous appointment. So in a few minutes, you'll see him drop off the call. Uh, but have no worries. Um, we'll still do the, the normal Q&A at the end of the of this session. And uh, any questions, uh, make sure you include them in the Q&A little box, which I'll monitor. Uh, anything we can't get to today, we'll send to the speakers for, uh, for a written response. Um, so enough for me, Kevin. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, before I start, I want to highlight that I'm speaking to you from Yellowknife, which is in the traditional lands of the Yellowknife Dene and Chief Drygees territory. Uh, I'm going to be presenting on the NWT approach to right to repair, and I'm looking forward to getting feedback and thoughts from you on how we are doing things up here. Uh, to start with, I'll give you a bit of an overview uh, on where CMBS is right is at uh, with the right to repair uh, issue in Canada. Uh, CMBS um, uh, has worked has a working group which was led by Tedford and Adil. It began to meet in the spring of 2022 to build the right to repair strategy for Canada. In October 2022, CMBS had the first of the two kickoff webinars with our colleagues from the, in the US presenting on their challenges and approach to right to repair. And I encourage anybody who's interested in downloading that presentation and watching it. Uh, this current presentation, the right to repair, is to provide an overview of what is happening in Europe and it also uh, our micro model here in the Northwest Territories. As an aside, I want to highlight in parallel to this, CMBS is looking at communicating with the federal government, in particular, in support of Bill C-244, which is a private member's bill, to amend the Copyright Act. This amendment is very significant as it will allow third-party service software to be developed and distributed, which can bypass vendor lockouts for the purposes of service. Uh, and would be instrumental in uh, right to repair. Finally, the national levels, uh, the CMBS's working group is planning a session in the upcoming May 2023 conference for to focus on right to repair. The results of this conference session uh, could then guide a white paper. Uh, at a provincial level, and more particularly the NWT, I'll give you a quick overview of our environment and a context that allows us to rapidly micro-model right to repair and other health technology management ideas. In 2016, the NWT formed the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority, and the NWT Biomedical Engineering Pro Program supports all of the health facilities in the Northwest Territories, and we collaborate with the government of Nunavut and support the Kivalik and Katikmit regions in the 
in, in that territory. While we are geographically large, as most of you know, the area we support only has a population of approximately 50,000 people, and an NTHSSA only has 1,800 employees. In fact, um, Alberto's company has more employees than our tertiary care hospital. Uh, we also work very closely with health technology planning team in the Department of Health and Social Services, who manage all the evergreening of health technology in the NWT. So the ability to rapidly micromodel new operational and policy concepts is easy, as the size of our organization is quite small in comparison to other jurisdictions. Consequently, we, starting in 2019, we began to integrate right to repair clauses into our territorial health technology service and support policy. So how did we do this? Uh, in uh, first step was when I came back to the territorial biomedical engineering role in 2018, I noticed that we, when we approached vendors uh, for the elements of right to repair, we received statements like, I'm afraid it is against our policy to provide service manuals, service parts, et cetera. Well, vendors have every right to create whatever business policy they want, even short-sighted and ultimately detrimental ones like they are, in my opinion, uh, as a jurisdiction, it occurred to me that we have an equal right to set our own policy and procurement requirements. Thus, we decided to create the right to repair policy clauses in our territorial um, health technology service and support policy. To create the necessary policy clauses, we started first by researching the issue. We reached out to Health Canada Medical Device Licensing to see if they are working on anything in that regard. We also met with the American College of Clinical Engineers uh, and particularly the lead on that issue of right to repair in the States, Dr. Bin Sing Wang, to see what they are doing and get a sense of all the various vendor approaches to restricting right to repair, some of which Alberto has brought up and some of the uh, usual excuses. Uh, we then added clauses to our health technology service support policy, making right to repair mandatory for all health technology purchased for use in the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority. We built into pressure relief some clauses, though, uh, which allowed the territory manager or the executive to waive the use of those clauses. For example, if at this time there were no clinical acceptable alternatives, we can waive the mandatory requirement. However, to date, I actually haven't found a situation where there is not a clinical acceptable alternative or technical acceptable alternative available on the market, which complies with right to repair. We always had elements of right to repair in our procurement documents, but this policy cha change gave the weight and also a certain degree teeth needed to support these procurement requirements and more importantly, emphasize the issue with vendors. So the next step uh, was we began to enforce these right to repair procurement requirements. We also observed in more detail the different ways vendors were attempting to restrict right to repair and updated the policy to cover those various tricks. We're now on version four of the policy because there's a lot of interesting techniques being used. For example, we ran into situations where vendors were overpricing their service training, service manuals and service parts or software, just basically for even bread and butter stuff, just to make it almost impossible to repair. Uh, restricting access to service manuals or updates, also using technology so like there was no PDF copies available of the service manual or making up legal regulations, reasons why some of their products cannot have service training provided. For example, one major vendor kept saying, we can only train our staff or third party service staff, but it is against regulations to factory train in hospital technical staff. Of course, they've never provided these supposed regulations uh, when, when requested uh, because they don't exist. So, uh, the third step was to implement the right to repair policy was to create purchasing guidelines and a uh, template of tender and RFP clauses. We are happy to share these guidelines and clauses with anyone who wants them, and we welcome feedback on them. While our territorial level policy takes one to two months to change in our system as it has to go through all executive and ultimately the CEO for signatures, a guideline can be changed by biomedical engineering instantly. So if you have a chance to review the guideline and clauses and have ideas, please let us know. I'll be sharing them with you in the next few slides. Another step that we took and then linked in CMBS is we met with a group purchasing, our group purchasing organization to encourage them to adopt rate to repair weighted criteria. Uh, but most important, we're taking the time to work with vendors. 
In particular, those vendors are just starting to head down, which is, in my opinion, is non-compliance, the non-compliance pathway. I be strongly in collaborating with vendors and our policy guidelines stress the need to communicate with them should they be deemed non-compliant with right to repair. The only way to work successfully is to work collaboratively with vendors. And um, uh, while there are a lot of uh, fear, uncertainty, doubt, FUD, as our American colleagues call it, call, it, call it, being thrown around, on the whole, there are a lot of vendors out there that work are working very hard and collaboratively and have good products and good right to repair solutions in place. So next, I'm just going to uh, rapidly jump through our policy and procurement clauses. I'm not going to go into detail, but have listed the primary clauses so people can download the presentation and reference them or borrow them if they want to. Uh, note that I'm more than happy to share our actual policy and guideline documents directly with anyone who asks. The implementation of the policy hinges around uh, uh, definitions of right to repair and also uh, what I call clinical acceptable alternative. We need standardized definitions of both of these in order for procurement guidelines to work. For example, the definition of right to repair is critical. Otherwise, you could have some vendors saying that they are compliant with right to repair because they gave you a technical manual. We've all had those provided where it, every second line says, uh, call the, uh, the manufacturer or only provide one level of service password, or you can validate the device during PM, but to calibrate, you must send to the vendor, or to the OEM. Uh, so having a proper definition of right to repair is important. Uh, again, uh, uh, I've attached the policy terms for later reference, or you're welcome to contact me. Uh, and I'll move on without going into detail, but I'm happy to discuss uh, the re reasons for some of the clauses uh, with anyone later, because some of them, you might go, why did you put that kind of clause in there? And usually it's because we found that it, there was a approach being taken that contradicted the right to repair. Also attached are, is a copy of the potential tender RFP clauses that we're starting to standardize to. It's important to emphasize that you need to put in the time to do the analysis of the available products on the market when you build an RFP or tender to ensure that you can filter whether it has to be a must or it has to be a should for the current situation. Uh, in this case, clause A ensures factory service training will be the same type and level as supplied to the OEM engineers. Uh, clause, in this case, clause B ensures ongoing provision of service parts. Clause C ensures service manuals are the same type supplied to the rigid equipment manufacturer and that you can get accessible versions. You know, your techs have the ability to print uh, sections if they need it, and there are no inherent restrictions to the manuals or updates. It also ensures that there are if there are costs associated with accessing the service manuals, that any vendor playing uh, the overpricing game of their manuals will, will significantly limit their ability to be competitive. Hence, the two times the lifespan clause, which is legitimate just and justifiable, as we have all had made to maintain equipment for more than double its lifespan. And we need to know we have access to the manuals during that period of time. Uh, the last set of clauses ensure that we get the specialized test equipment, software, and uh, service passwords necessary to maintain the equipment. So having gone through that, what is next? I encourage everyone to come to the CMBS conference and more particularly attend the session on right to repair that is currently being developed. Based on the account come of that uh, session, CMS is hoping to generate a white paper and potentially update their uh, national uh, standards of practice. I want to encourage all jurisdictions to work with their procurement areas to start integrating right to repair requirements for all health technology purchases. You have a lot of weight to substantiate those clauses, even without the policy being in place since due to COVID and the fact that there was a lack of ability of vendors to meet their service commitments during that time posed a significant risk to our healthcare system as a whole. Uh, Alberto brought up the issue around servicing ventilators, for example. Uh, I found myself uh, installing with a manufacturer, very collaboratively, it was an excellent manufacturer, uh, high-level laboratory devices during COVID. So we know that there are situations where we need to be able to access the required service things to provide care safely. As mentioned, CBS CMBS has started a dialogue with one major GPO who is very interested in adding right to repair clauses to their RFPs. They wouldn't be mandatory clauses, of course, but then 
they would provide a flag for us to select a product. So if you had that flag and you saw that uh, you signed on to a GP GPO product line, group purchasing organization product line, uh, with one vendor and one vendor is compliant, one isn't, pick the vendor that's compliant with right to repair if it meets your needs. Finally, and in conclusion, help to help spur on some potential discussion following this presentation. I wanted to leave about 15 minutes for that. Uh, I want to provide some ideas that I've heard. They're not mine. Uh, maybe an idea of having CMBS, ACC, and or IFMB work together to create right to repair compliance certification. You saw the eco certification, something similar. So if vendors are fully compliant with right to repair, they can, they can advertise that with their product. And we would look for that. Uh, maybe encouraging ECRI with their product comparison and their product analysis services to start including criteria for right to repair compliance. Anyway, I'd really like to hear other ideas and I'm always open to having discussions with anyone in the future on this topic. Thank you. And I hope I didn't go too quickly, but I wanted to give time for discussion because I know in every single time we this topic has come up, there's been a huge amount of discussion around it and I look forward to hearing it. Yes, it is rather an energizing uh, topic, Kevin. <laughs> totally, totally agree. So yeah, if, if you have any questions, uh, please you know utilize the Q and A feature um, on anything that we've talked about today. Um, yeah, I like I, your suggestions there, Kevin, uh, on your on your last slide. Uh, sorry, Adil. No, uh, I see there's some questions in the chat box. Uh, mm -hmm. They're 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 around uh, the normal arguments around fear. What happens if like a, a a guy with a wrench tries to fix the equipment, basically. What happens if we kill people, right? So uh, by re unqualified people being repairing the equipment. So I don't know, do we want to address that question? It's an easy one to deal with. Sure. So I've heard this argument, uh, the American colleagues refer to it as fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's the main lobbying uh, element that the OEMs use with the politicians in the states as they work on right to repair uh, legislation down there. Uh, in my opinion, there's uh, in Canada, there's a, a number of protections in place. One, we're, we're a public health care system. The, there are professional engineers and qualified biomed techs in, I think, essentially every healthcare system who ensure the quality uh, of service. We also have accredited programs. The few times I've run into vendors who have actually told me that I am not, my staff aren't qualified to service us. In one case, it was a suction pump. Um, when I actually went back to them and said, I'm the professional engineer responsible for all health technology in the Northwest Territories, so therefore, I need you to actually tell me that your people are qualified and show me that they're um, graduated from an accredited program, which is my job description, that they meet certain quality, they would never provide their job description stuff because there's no BMET alive that's working on suction pumps only exclusively, and that's what this company primarily sold. So they couldn't even meet the very criteria that they were trying to set um, in terms of uh, ensuring that the right people are servicing devices. The risk and the FDA has done a study on this and has proved and has demonstrated in a report that there is absolutely no example of uh, loss of safety due to this. Uh, uh, the other thing around uh, overriding interlocks, again, for higher level devices, uh, uh, I'm not sure about you guys, but we would factory train people. Talked about high level technology, you would factory train people. Then we would require access to all the service passwords. For lower level devices, and what's starting to happen is people are starting to password protect uh, replacement of batteries because they're chipping the batteries. So I'm sorry. Like in those cases, yes. Because again, qualified biomed techs would be doing the device service and they would validate the device before use. I, there is no risk uh, to be managed. And we all work in accredited programs. So that's my answer to the issue. I don't know if other people have feedback on it. I think it's, very, I think it's a fair point where we all do our own qualifications, et cetera. I mean, how many programs across Canada don't have 
you know, in the jobs in the job description for a preferential engineer. Um, if you're junior and just getting in and you're only in EIT, you have two years to get your PNG. If you're already a PNG, you have six months to transfer to your new province if you're not already there. Um, a similar thing with uh, uh, with uh, CBET, et cetera. I don't think BMET is, um, is required everywhere, but I mean, some kind of CET, whatever your flavor of it for your province, um, or you're not working in the hospital. <laughs> That's pretty common. So, and I, I won't say who it was, but I do recall hearing um, someone complain that they were refused permission to work on a particular device, saying that their techs weren't qualified. They had just hired the trainer from that company, and he was refused permission to work on the devices because he was not qualified. So yes, the, the FUD, fear, um, uncertainty, and doubt uh, is sadly real. <laughs> Yeah. And the big thing being that the FDA has actually done an analysis and there is no example or clearly documented example of, of, of injury due to uh, qualified staff, in-house staff working on equipment or qualified third party ISO vendors uh, working on. It's their business. It, they would be would, would be crazy. What is also hilarious is, is a number of the larger companies also are ISOs and they're working on other vendors products so the argument falls flat at that point yeah absolutely um and i do hope uh, from the presentation and um this again this session is meant to to spark activity and sharing from different jurisdictions across canada maybe we can come up with a, a stock um vanilla version of clauses that folks could include in their own competitive um uh, uh, processes for here's uh, some repairability um, example uh, clauses and then you can evaluate using this and this uh, different approaches might be a good thing kind of like our Canadianization of that uh, French repairability uh, um, uh, component. Um, uh, Ted out in BC has uh, has a question. Could you elaborate, please, on your expected life and availability of parts, say the typical seven to 10 years? Sorry, who were you asking? Uh, you, <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> Sorry, can you say the question again? Sure. Um, I think he's queuing more from the... Um, uh, what do you do over the life and then past the life? So could you elaborate on your expected life and availability of parts um, in, in the typical seven to 10 years? So we've had this clause for the seven, 10 year clause in place since early thousands. It was a standardized clause that we put in. So the idea being that from the time we, and, we, and it actually came about because what was happening in the Northwest Territories is we were all of a sudden getting the end of life crap dumped on the territory for a deal because uh, we're so small um, and we have we had less capacity and expertise um, at the time so um, what what we put in was a clause that required the availability of parts for seven years past the end of life like once a vendor says okay we're going to be starting end of life we wanted to see for seven years or 10 years from purchase whichever was longer uh, if that's actually come in handy, we had a vendor send a notice formally telling us that they're no longer be going to be supporting a particular product. And we handed them back their service contract or the purchase agreement that they signed saying, well, actually, you got to do it until this period of time. And they went, oops, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, we will service it until then. So it, it is it's it's feasible for them to do it. It's it's strictly a revenue marketing thing. Uh, uh, Ninety percent of the time. Uh, uh, where they are obsoleting equipment. For example, it's not unusual for vendors when they decide to obsolete a device to then dispose of all their uh, service parts. Uh, and that way you have to buy the next product. So this clause just protects us and, and it's worked. And so far we haven't run into a situation where a vendor couldn't comply with it or find a solution to comply with it. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, if we take that in with what we were just talking about and then tie it back a little bit further to what Alberto was talking about, where you really realistically, he men was mentioning when you're evaluating, look at the entire uh, cost of ownership life. 
um, the entire life. So you have your warranty and your initial contract and how much will it cost? And can you even still um, maintain and support that system after a contract? Like if you take those three aspects together, again, uh, if we can come up with some kind of stock starter language for our different RFPs and our RFXs um, might not be a bad thing. Um, Martin uh, is very appreciative. Uh, he said, I, Kevin, I like your suggestion to get ECRI to include language uh, on their comparison criteria. Um, have you approached them? Uh, I, I had, uh, so there is a new ECRI rep for Canada and I can't remember his name off the top of my head. We're actually communicating with them now as we're trying to upgrade our service for the three territories. And uh, uh, I, I initially bounced the idea past him. It's not really in his remit, but my plan was to start uh, bringing it forward uh, in more, in more, uh, with them in more detail. But I was over in Nunavut in Iqaluit uh, working with my colleague there, and we were actually having a presentation and I raised the initial point with them there. That's the first time I've done it, but I'd like to see it in their product comparison or their product analysis products that they supply. So my thought was to reach out through people I know at ECRI to see if that's a feasible option to add. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question, um, it's really talking about patient owned devices. Uh, Kevin, you speak about biotechs and accredited programs. However, patients at home that bought a device at the pharmacy won't go to a biomed at the hospital to repair it. Um, who would they go to? There's no formal requirements for them. I think we keep, uh, I think we keep on uh, forgetting that a lot of our devices are out in the market and not in a hospital. That's a pretty specific niche. And I'm not, I mean, you, you respond, but I'm not sure if that would um, totally fall under us. I, I understand the fear on that one. Uh, now, what you're starting to drift into there, though, is consumer grade equipment, which is a whole other kettle of fish. It's essentially disposable in terms of price to begin with. And to a certain extent, the, bar, the, the argument falls apart since the vendor has no control over the, because we've looked at what are the implications of home care here in, in the Northwest Territories uh, and supporting the equipment there. And the, you have no control over the patient environment and you have no control over what the patient and how they even do their user maintenance or even if they do user maintenance in that environment. And I have yet to find a consumer grade product that is actually properly validatable or, or, or like the vendors are already protecting themselves from a liability perspective for the consumer grade equipment. So they, they have enough clauses in their documents around that. Yeah, fair point. How many of us have uh, come up against uh, some research group, tried to save money, and they bought uh, those little home uh, uh, NIBP systems that on page two says not for hospital use. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But the same uh, argument applies to like, well, what about a car and, yeah. the, and and maintaining that? What about, you know, so yeah, I can start ripping into my car and override things and stuff like that, but why would I do it? Yeah, right. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. So and then so the same liability would that would that could kill people even faster. Right. At 100 kilometers per hour. Yes. Yes. So so the arguments I can see, again, fear, uncertainty, doubts. These are good questions. These are exactly what's being brought forward. But there's a difference between consumer grade and hospital grade, in my opinion. I, I personally, I agree with that. And uh, I like the way you put it at the first, which is um, one is almost like um, disposable level consumer um approach where if it breaks the the level that you're buying is not a hospital grade it, it's not the same thing um it's designed into it that the way you maintain that is it goes into the round file and you buy a new one and when it's done and same with calibrations etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean that's that's how it's designed uh Which and, from an environmental perspective yeah not so good from yeah from a green perspective um m gifford has a question from the legal standpoint, my understanding is the structure around right to repair is still in the works. Uh, from an equipment owner standpoint, what can we ask a manufacturer to provide under the right to repair guidance if the equipment is already off warranty 
and purchased, meaning you have no leverage. Uh, yeah, so there you're you're just making notes. So we we had that situation as I mentioned the vendor we are we we purchased the equipment. I made a, erroneous assumptions because it was just a section device, and then we found out that yes, you get a technical manual that allows you to validate it every year. Your service techs are expected to do the the validation on it, but if you have to actually repair it, you have to send it to us because you're not qualified to service a suction unit. Your techs aren't qualified to service a suction unit. Um, the, there's nothing. Like we inform them that fine, understand in the future, your product will no longer meet our, we found alternatives. Your product will no longer meet our requirement for right to repair and you won't be selling the product in the territory. And that's all we could do. Unfortunately, you are kind of stuck at that point. You've lost leverage. However, if we start working together, then there might be opportunities. Yeah, I mean, everyone gets uh, has um, freedom of choice uh, to uh, in their selling and buying. So I think I think that's a pretty good point. Um, so we are at one fifty seven again. Um, we're we finish at uh, at two o'clock, and again, that's Atlantic time. Uh, adjust for where you are in the country. There are some questions that are written in the chat, which I'll start into right now, but have no fear. Um, we'll transcribe your questions and send them to the presenters and then distribute the answers. Uh, and even if you have questions that you come up with afterwards, feel free to send those along and, and we'll do our best to get them answered. Um, so at 158, I think we might have, uh, depending how quick you are, um, uh, time for one more question, Kevin, if you're up for it. Uh, hi, Kevin, you mentioned that, um, this is from Mitch Randall. Um, hi, Kevin, you mentioned that manuals and trainings could be cost prohibitive. Would you have specific guidelines of what a fair cost would be? For instance, would it be a percentage of the total cost of the equipment? Um, this has happened in the consumer electronic space where you have the right, but it'll cost you. So in, in my mind, uh, so I actually don't have a price on there, but, you know, we had one major vendor for an electric surgical unit who at one point they wanted almost, I think it was like around $20,000 to get the training and some of the test equipment and stuff like that. And we're not talking the generic stuff. We're talking the bits and mods, right? And uh, that's, you know, we have four units. So that's that's basically means I have to ship in and ship out, which then raises the question of the safety of that device after it's banged all over the north and down and up again. Uh, so the safety issue again goes out the window, but pricing wise, it's a judgment call each time depending on the cost of the device. So for example, for a $100,000 or $200,000 or $300,000 fixed x-ray room, you know, um, a percentage of that is not unreasonable. Right. So if you're looking at a full service contract at 10% of acquisition value, you would adjust then your pricing that you would to take that over accordingly. Does that make sense? Both the training makes, makes total sense. Um, and actually, if we take that along with the point we were just talking about, I think if we roll that into some here's some starter clauses for your next RFX, you make it scorable points. Um, you tell them right up front, this is going to be a whole cost of ownership um, uh, calculation. Uh, you have to work with your purchasing group in your different areas because different purchasing groups kind of have a different take on what's a hard cost, what's a soft cost. You can only really uh, legitimately take into account hard costs when you're doing a cost of ownership. Otherwise, you're opening yourself up to a lawsuit. Um, but yeah, I think actually that gives great fodder to us maybe to come up with some suggested starter language and just have it available. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're at the hour deal. So thank you very much, Kevin. That's really, really appreciative of, of your time and expertise and knowledge today. Uh, with that, Adil, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I'm just going to say um, all of the good discussion, bring it to the conference, right? We're going to, we'll be there. We'll be talking about it uh, in detail. Uh, and I think this is this is the type of discussion we need to get this, uh, get, get more for a focus and headway on this topic. So yeah, with that, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, we'll be uh, working on a couple of additional things for uh, March, so stay tuned for uh, a, a, a tidbit on women 
in STEM. So look out for that through the CMBS communications. Um, and with that, um, happy Tuesday. Thank you, everybody. And we'll talk to you soon.